Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Dr. Andy Seidel serves as Executive Director for our Center for Christian Leadership. We sort of have two branches now, the Center for Christian Leadership and Cultural Engagement. Andy Seidel heads up the Christian Leadership side. Dr. Bach heads up the uh, Center for Cultural Engagement. Uh, the Center for Christian Leadership provides leadership training and development for our seminary students, uh, also uh, ministry uh, leaders and business leaders. It's a, it's a three-prong uh, effort. Uh, Randy's a graduate of West Point, uh, was a colonel in the U.S. Army. He was senior pastor of the Grace Bible Church in College Station, Texas for 14 years. I was waiting for that, thank you. He left the pastorate to provide leadership training for pastors on the mission field in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union. Today, he continues to work in Russia, Eastern Europe, Central Asia with Entrust, uh, formerly BEE International. Uh, he's the author of Charting a Bold Course, Training Leaders for the 21st Century Ministry. He's married to his wife, Gail, and Gail serves with us also uh, in the leadership center and especially in the spiritual formation area. And uh, she is here. Gail, would you just say hi? Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> wonderful couple, wonderful team of ministry. They've been married for over 40 years. They have two married children and six grandchildren. Uh, it's a privilege to work with Andy. Would you welcome Dr. Andy Seidel to our platform this morning? Well, I was just having one of those moments sitting over there with all mic'd up and the microphone here while we were singing that hymn. And I remember as a pastor, when the guys back in the booth wanted to play a joke on me, they would turn up my volume while we were singing. Because <laughs> I can't sing. About five years ago, I was uh, at the board meeting of our mission in trust in Colorado Springs. And through the early part of the meeting, I noticed that the young woman who was our secretary seemed kind of uh, unfocused. She's a very competent, very lovely young lady. And I thought maybe it was something wrong, and it went through the meeting, and uh, it got kind of worse and worse. And so towards the end of the day, I went over and I asked her, you know, what's wrong? And all of a sudden there were tears in her eyes. And all she could say was, my pastor. It had just been reported that her pastor had a very terrible moral failure. He's a very successful pastor. He was pastor of a major church there. He started in his own living room, and by this time it was 14,000 attendees at the church. And so he was a figure. He was also the head of the National Association of Evangelicals, so he was known all over the country. And the only thing you can say about what happened, and in fact what is still happening there, was this train wreck. And all kinds of people were hurt by it. Sunday, as the board meeting was over and I was at the airport, the paper was there and there was a picture and big headlines of his fall picture of one woman in the seat of empty pews just distraught. And the problem is that's not the only incident like this. That's just one of the more prominent ones. This is something that happens often today. The statistics, when you get down to it, statistics are terrible. I like to use the statistics from Focus on the Family because they are much lower than some of the others. The focus on the family says that one pastor in this country, one pastor a day, is a moral failure. It's not just pastors. That's true of leaders really all through this society. There's a growing body of leadership literature studying what they call derailment. They take that from the train wreck metaphor. Studies about derailment began when they studied people who had all kinds of abilities and gifts. They expected them to be CEOs or something, but they didn't make it there. And so they say, well, why didn't they make it there? 
And then as the research continued, they began to study and to notice the fact that uh, stress is involved in some of these failures. And so they studied stress and derailment. And more recently, the studies have really gone to the whole area that is very surprising, and that is the area of success and derailment. See, a surprising number of leaders who fall are very, very successful. And the success has something to do with their failure. Now, I'd rather talk about a lot of other things this morning, but I want to talk about this one. Because one of the, the great blessings that we have as faculty is we get to work with you. You know, graduates from this seminary have gone out and they are major leaders, uh, very successful leaders in various parts of the Christian world. Some of them are pastors of major churches. Some of them are leaders of wonderful men's ministries or men, women's ministries. Some of them are heads of seminaries. Some of them are heads of missionary, mission organizations or work in missions and have a significant impact. And you're no different than them. I suspect as you go out of here, many of you will be very successful in ministry. And that's a wonderful thing. But it's also a dangerous thing. It's dangerous because oftentimes we are not prepared for what it brings our way. Now, this isn't something new. This has been true throughout human history. And so I want you to open your Bibles to a passage in 2 Chronicles, chapter 26. Not some place that we often go, but this is the story of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And one of the things that we learn is that leaders can become very successful. And by all accounts, Uzziah was a successful leader. He was a strong leader. We begin reading in chapter 6, verse 1, And all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the place of his father Amaziah. And he built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his father. Uzziah was 16 years old. That's the second time he said this, when he became king. And he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. And he continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. No, he was a very competent leader. In many ways, as you read the verses that follow this, Uzziah was a Renaissance man. He did five major things that the chronicler accounts in these next few verses. First, he extended the boundaries of Judah, defeating the Philistines, the Arabians, and a bunch of people I can't even pronounce. Secondly, he impacted the countries and rulers around Judah. The Ammonites to the north, they paid tribute to him. His fame spread all the way to the southwest, to Egypt. He became very strong and he was respected by the leaders of the nations around him. Third thing he did is he fortified Jerusalem and other places there in Judah. He built towers and he built buttresses to keep the walls strong. The fourth, he improved and built up agriculture throughout Judah in verse 10. Very sweet statement about him. He loved the soil. And so he had cisterns dug and towers built throughout the land. He had livestock and plowmen and vineyards and vine dressers. And it must have been a great day in Judah during those years. And then I appreciate the fifth thing about him is he developed a powerful military. The army was, first of all, well organized. It was organized into divisions, and there were 2,600 very valiant warriors who maybe were the leaders, and there were another 300 plus thousand troops that were divided into these divisions. So they were well organized. They're also well armed. This is one of those times where it indicates that the king had 
uh, military equipment made for these soldiers. He had shields and spears and helmets and body armor and bows and slinging stones made for them. He started the Judah military industrial complex. And then third, he introduced some new weapons technology, some protected spots on the towers where people, soldiers could fire arrows or throw rocks. And you put all of that together, by any measure, Uzziah was a successful king. Two reasons why. We've seen one in verse 5, God prospered him. In verse 7 and verse 15, God helped him. Now, why God prospered him? Two reasons. In verse 4, because he did right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 5, because he sought the Lord. In other words, Uzziah realized that his dependence was upon the Lord. And so God helped him. This again, the results of God's help, two ways. His fame spread afar. That's said twice. And secondly, Uzziah became very strong. That also is said twice. But see, the problem is that success has an impact on leaders. Uzziah began to change. And so when you get to verse 16, there is the first of two big contrasting statements. But because, you see, success brings its own set of temptations to leaders. In some of the literature you find now they're talking about a couple of syndromes where certain characteristics come together and have an impact, and so they're called syndromes. Joanne Ciela, writing in a book about ethics and leadership, uh, chapter Ethics, Chaos, and the Demand for Good Leaders, she writes, the moral foible that the public fears most in a leader is personal immorality accompanied by an abuse of power the Bathsheba syndrome. The interesting thing, she goes on, about the Bathsheba syndrome is that it is hard to predict because people get it after they have become successful. Now, first of all, it's really kind of unfair here, isn't it? I mean, David abuses his power, but Bathsheba gets her name on the syndrome. <clears throat> but that's being discussed. That, that syndrome, Bathsheba syndrome, it's all over secular literature about leadership. And leadership derailment. Another writer, Clinton Longnecker, writing about Bathsheba syndrome, says there are four potential byproducts of success which can cause many leaders to fall into ethical violation. The first is that success often allows leaders to become complacent and lose strategic focus, diverting their attention to things other than their leadership responsibilities. Like the pastor who is so focused as he's building the church and it's getting larger and he's concerned about the vision and the people and, and really working this all together and having a successful ministry and reaching the people. And it gets to be to a certain point and it becomes successful. And then he's in kind of the role of keeping it going. Which really isn't as exciting as building it up. And so he begins to really let his attention drift. Secondly, Longnecker says that success often leads to privileged access to information, to people, or to objects. Of those, the one that jumps out at me is people. You see, leadership is a relational exercise. You lead people. There are relationships involved. And as you become successful, one of the things that happens is people want to be near you. They want to be close to you. They want to be liked by you. And you can find yourself kind of enjoying that. They identify with you. I mean, the current uh, research is saying that one of the things leaders do is they become the identity for the group that they lead. It's a good thing. But the problem is, is if I identify with you, that can easily cross the boundary of intimacy. Third thing, he says, is that success often leads to unrestrained control of organizational resources. 
When you're that successful at that much power, then you have control of resources. No question about it. Sometimes people don't even check your control of resources. A man who started as a missionary, started working overseas in a third world country, was very, very concerned about the poor. He set up soup kitchens for the poor. Later on, he worked to help people with addictions. And as he became a leader in the ministry, he grew the ministry to be a successful national organization. After reaching that level of success, he was discovered to be guilty of fraud and tax evasion. Of course, success can inflate a leader's belief in his or her own, her own personal ability to manipulate or to control outcomes. How sad was the pastor who discovered in an affair in the course of the discussion said, I thought I could keep it a secret so it wouldn't hurt my marriage or my ministry. For Uzziah, the core issue is pride. And so you get to verse 16, but when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. Now, his heart was so proud that it clouded his judgment, obstructed his ability to make good decisions, and so he decided, I'll go and burn incense in the temple. And so he made a choice. The chronicler says he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord. In other words, he forgot his dependence on the Lord. The term unfaithful is a term which becomes prominent in the rest of Chronicles. It's about someone who has a responsibility in which they do not fulfill. And Uzziah's responsibility was to the Lord his God who had made him successful. Who had helped him so greatly. Now Uzziah knew better. I don't think it was a surprise to him that he shouldn't have been there. But somehow his pride disqualified the alternative. His predecessor, a couple of centuries before, Solomon said, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But his pride somehow covered the truth, so he just couldn't see it. Maybe it's like the great theologian Bob Dylan said. The walls of pride are high and wide can't see over to the other side. Uzziah, like many successful leaders at that point in his life, couldn't see over to the other side. He knows better, but his ability to make a good decision is hijacked by his pride. Pride gets mixed reviews today. Joel Osteen said, you need to take pride in what God has given you. Billy Graham says, self-centered indulgence, pride, and a lack of shame over sin are now emblems of the American lifestyle. Another writer says, greed, envy, sloth, and he's starting on the seven deadlies here. Greed, envy, sloth, pride, and gluttony. These are not vices anymore. No, these are marketing tools. Lust is our way of life. Envy is just a nudge toward another sale. The pride's a problem for leaders. Successful leaders are at risk of developing another syndrome, which is called in the literature the hubris syndrome. Now, hubris is exaggerated pride. David Owen and Jonathan Davidson, writing in a journal titled Brain in 2009, wrote... Hubris syndrome is an acquired condition. And it's therefore different from most personality disorders which are traditionally seen as persistent throughout adulthood. The key concept is that hubris syndrome is a disorder of the possession of power, particularly power which has been associated with overwhelming success, held for a period of years and with minimal constraints upon the leader. You know, hubris was the one quality that the ancient Greeks did not want in their leaders. To them, hubris is equating yourself to the gods. 
And the reason they didn't want their leaders to have hubris is that hubris prevents leaders from treating followers with respect. Well, and Scott said it uh, very well, beware of pride. It's the tumor in your mind that breaks and poisons all of your actions. It's the friend of the flatterer, the mother of envy, the nurse of fury, the band of luxury and the sin of devils. And the nurse of fury led Uzziah into destruction. And so there he is in the temple with the censer. He's going to burn incense before the Lord. And all of a sudden, he gets a wake-up call. Azariah, the chief priest, and 80 other priests come in. I don't know how he got in there without somebody stopping him, but he did. But they knew he was in there, heard he was in there, and so they came in and they confronted him. And Azariah tells Uzziah, verse 18, get out of the sanctuary. He tells him that he has been unfaithful and will have no honor from the Lord. Now, Uzziah should have recognized the wrong he was doing. At least at that point, he should have recognized it. I think if he had texted, OMG, you know, I'm wrong and left, <laughs> you know, he would have been forgiven. But he didn't do that. Psychologist Carl Jung may be a little optimistic when he wrote, through pride we are ever deceiving ourselves. But deep down below the surface of the average conscience, a still small voice says to us, something is out of tune. If the voice was there, Uzziah didn't heed it. And so in verse 19, you have the second of the but, the big contrast. What happens is rather than confessing, Uzziah goes ballistic. And he burns with anger. As you do the proud, the slightest repulse or disappointment is the last indignity. Back in 2003, uh, Dutch and Cairo did a survey of CEOs who had failed. And what they came up with was a list of 10 characteristics associated with CEO failure. You know what the number one characteristic was? Arrogance. And that's how Uzziah responded. He is arrogant that they would challenge him and keep him from doing. Why he wanted to do that, I don't know. Maybe that was just the one thing that he had been prohibited from doing as king. Maybe it was because some of the Canaanite kings were both priests and kings. Whatever it was, he refused. Commenting on that study by Dotlich and Cairo, another writer says, highly arrogant people expect to be admired, praised, indulged, and obeyed. They expect to be successful in everything they do. They believe in their own legacy, and when their expectations are frustrated, they explode with narcissistic rage. And so Uzziah explodes, and then all of a sudden, on his forehead, leprosy breaks out, and everything is stopped, and the priests rush him out of the temple, and the way it is written, it's almost like he's running faster than they are now. He lives in a separate house for the rest of his life, and his son becomes king in his place. It's a tragic story, but it's all too often repeated. But you know, the good thing is that it doesn't have to end that way. Leaders can avoid derailment. And to avoid derailment, there are three things that are critical. The one is a sense of openness and accountability. See, every leader needs a relationship with someone that he or she can be open and vulnerable with about what's going on in his or her life. Sometimes it's a trusted friend. But you know, the research hurts us again here. Leadership Journal survey says 70% of pastors say they do not have someone they consider to be a close friend. 
Sometimes it's a mentor. If you go back to verse 5, you notice that during a good part of Uzziah's reign, he had Zechariah. Now, we don't know much about Zechariah. Not much is said about Zechariah in this passage. We don't really know who he is, but we know he was in touch with God. And as long as he was there, the, the chronicler puts the two together that as long as Zechariah was there, Uzziah followed the Lord. Such a person can provide wisdom in times of difficulty, perspective when things are unclear. And let me tell you, in leadership and ministry, there are a lot of things that get to be unclear. They can also provide corrective to faulty thinking. As I was a pastor in College Station, Texas in those days, that, Grace Bible Church was the only Bible church in town. Some of the other pastors had their groups and stuff, but we, we were the only one. And to find someone to be a mentor, I had to travel. And so I came up here and met with Don Geiger, who was a pastor at the time, later on the board of the seminary. And it was incredibly helpful. He gave me a whole day just to hear me talk about what was going on and how I was feeling about the church. Several times I made a trip down to Houston to Bob Tolson, who was the pastor of Bethel Church in Houston. He was a mentor as well. In a more general way, are you open to honest feedback from your staff? You know, there are some leaders, especially ones that are beginning to get successful, really all they want to hear is agreement. I want you to, you know, just bless what I'm saying and what I want to do and go on and don't... Uh, Say anything back. Some leaders never let others get close. I was fortunate to have on the staff an associate pastor I was friends with, who I know, if I had started to go off the reservation, he would have come and he would have said something like, Chief, you're going the wrong direction. Robert would have done that. And I was fortunate. Secondly, we need self-awareness. In fact, a lot of the research says, a great book by Tim Irwin entitled Derailed, he says the lack of self-other awareness is the common denominator in all derailments. You see, we, we all have normal needs. But sometimes these needs develop into stronger hungers that impact our ability to think and act wisely. Heifetz and Linsky, writing a book, Leadership on the Line, they talk about three basic areas of human need. We all have a need for power and control to some extent. We have a need for affirmation and importance. We have a need for intimacy and delight. We need to be aware of these legitimate needs when they begin growing into hungers. Because some of the earlier problems in my growing up my most difficult need has always been affirmation and importance. I was a very insecure elementary school kid. Fortunately, that began to change in later junior high and high school and so on. But those things never really go away. I can remember as pastor of a church one day preaching a really good sermon. Things were going well, you know, we had just built a new building and I was walking, my office was in the new building and I was walking from the auditorium across the sidewalk over to the new building and I was thinking, yes, that was good. I mean, people, when I, you know, at the doorway when I was leaving, they were saying really good things and it was just flowing around in here like crazy. That was good. And then it took a little different, I am good. And the next voice through my head, that was a voice from hell. I'm, just, I'm not sure still where that came from because I didn't usually talk like that. But I can remember where I was on the sidewalk. Now, fortunately, I had some other people in the church that would help 
Let me keep straight. One of them was a dear man, who, an older gentleman who came to our church late. He was a very powerful man in the community. There were streets named after him. And I still remember it was a sermon about Paul and uh, Philemon. And <clears throat> I gave this sermon. It was a good sermon. And I walked standing back there and he comes out and I reached out to shake his hand. And he didn't shake my hand. He just looked at me. He said, preacher, you sure missed it today. He was, he was like that. And I said, well, Mr. Uh, what did I miss? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> You're not going to tell me. No, you go back and you study that passage again. We need people like that in our lives, too. You know, some of you, uh, hopefully all of you, have taken spiritual formation or in it now. In your third semester, some of you are in that semester now, you do an exercise that we call the screw tape letter, in which you write a letter about, so from the devil to your particular demon about how to make you fall. Sometimes students, oh, I don't want to do that. Why are we doing this silly exercise? That kind of thing. That's, you know, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be that open. I don't want to. You know what? Do it. Furthermore, write it very thoughtfully. And then keep it. And refer back to it. And as you go through ministry, expand it. Because one day, that level of awareness may save your ministry. Third thing, very quickly, is sensitivity to early warning signals. You know, we're not told much about Uzziah. I don't think he was wonderful as a leader, successful, and did everything right and followed God, and then the next day he went into the temple. I think there was some kind of a process that went on, and we're not told about that. But in that process, there are moments that are early warning signals. And so be aware of them. And one thing that is talked about is learn to get on the balcony. That is to be able to kind of get up on the balcony, look down on yourself in the midst of some conversation or some action and say, what's going on here? Why is my anger coming up? Why do I feel this attraction here? What's happening? If you listen to those early warning signals, you may be spared from the tragic end. The first half of Uzziah's story, he did right in the sight of God. He continued to seek God and was very successful. But our prayer for you is that your story he did right in the sight of God and was very successful. She continued to seek God and was very successful. And that's the whole story. Would you pray with me? Father, what a privilege it is, it is that you give us this faculty to work with and to relate to the students that you have brought here to Dallas Theological Seminary. We pray, Lord, that as you bless them, that they will follow you, that they will obey you, that they will seek you, and that they will continue to do that as you make them successful in ministry. That they will be aware of what's happening in their own lives, that they will relate well to people who can be of help, that they won't ignore the warning signals that you give. Father, bless them. Lord, be with them. So that at the end it might say, they were very successful in serving the Lord. And you were glorified through their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.